<laughs> well, it's a good question. Um, the difference is uh, minimal. I had the good fortune to first walk, work with George four or five years ago on his um, adaptation and television series of Catch-22, the uh, um, from the book by Joseph Heller, uh, in which I played General Dreedel. So um, I was not only directed by George, but we got to act together as well. And my abiding memory of uh, that week in Sardinia was laughing. Um, yes. He is a very, very funny guy to be around. Um, he wants everybody to have a good time. And we did. And we laughed lots. And um, uh, I really enjoyed being directed by him. He encouraged me to uh, go further with my characterization of General Dr Dreedel. Um, uh, and uh, w we struggled sometimes to keep a straight face uh, acting opposite one another. So when he asked me to do this, you know, I was absolutely delighted, of course. Um, um, I rather assumed when uh, he asked me to do it that somewhere he would be popping up in the film himself. But no, this was just um, as a director. And all I can say to you about George Clooney is that he creates the most wonderful, friendly, warm, creative atmosphere on set. I mean, the crew, uh, I think without exception, just adore him. And um, the cast uh, have a lot of banter with him. He has a lot of jokes at their expense. Um, and it's it's great fun. He's uh, uh, he's a marvelous guy to work for. And I suppose that Peter, in terms of this movie, it's set back in the nineteen thirties. And do we get a feel for that sort of era and decade uh, running throughout uh, the movie? Because when we're going back in time, in ter terms of pre-war sort of movies, sometimes they can sort of look more like fifties movies or sixties movies than maybe a decade, maybe like the nineteen thirties, which this is probably set in. And does it almost do you almost get the vibe and that sort of feel that you have been able to catch the time frame right in terms of this movie? Well, as far as I'm concerned, from the moment that I went for my first costume fitting and met, met uh, Jenny Egan, the costume designer, who had actually designed the costumes for Catch-22 as well, uh, you were back in 1936. You know, the, uh, the clothes you got to wear are fabulous. I mean, I happen to love that particular look. Uh, you know, baggy trousers, um, pleated at the front, lovely jackets, lovely materials. Um, and uh, we had a big cast. Yeah. Um, it was rather wonderful to um, work again because it doesn't happen so often these days. Um, it was rather wonderful to be on a set with, you know, four or 500 supporting artists all immaculately dressed in uh, gear from the 30s, um, fabulous makeup um, and hair for the women, hats. All the men wore hats, of course. Yeah. I, I, I sport a, a hat pretty much for the whole, whole movie. Um, and yeah, no, there was a, a real period feel for the 30s. And I did, I did kind of know a, a, a little bit about the world that I was entering before doing the film. I, you know, I'm a great um, documentary watcher and I'd seen lots of film uh, by the famous German uh, director, Leni Riefenstahl, who'd actually filmed the 1936 Berlin Olympics for um, Hitler. Um, and so uh, I, I knew what to expect and I wasn't disappointed. Um, there really was a very strong feel uh, of the 30s. Um, uh, I, I think the, the, the film looks great. Yeah. And I imagine with this sort of a topic, obviously it's about a University of Washington rowing team. So there was, a, I imagine there was an awful lot of location shooting that there was to try and get the outside sort of feel to it. Because normally we can see the effects of, 
green screen now in today's world. We can see the effects of studios and block shooting and what they can do in terms of constructing these sorts of studios and lofts. But when you're dealing with a concept and a practical sport and when you're dealing to show how people get immersed in this and growing, it's really more an, an outdoor activity in terms of pitching that sort of realism as well. So in terms of location and block lo location and the importance of the landscape and the wilderness and the, not the wilderness, but the scenic surroundings, they all play a pivotal role in the success of this movie. They're like the extra actor, or the extra leading role in terms of this success of the movie, where the the location is paramount. I imagine. Um, th th that that's true to an extent. Okay. Um, the film, of course, was all made here. We we never went to the states. We never went to um, Berlin. Uh, we used any strip of water that they could find to film on, uh, um, on the River Thames at Henley, on a huge reservoir just outside London, and on a beautiful stretch of water down um, at a place called Cleveland Water Park. And uh, there was a lot of magic went on for background stuff uh, in post, I suppose. But what George did was very cleverly, uh, although this has um, an epic feel to it, he focused very much on the boys and the boat. So um, you, you were drawn into the boat uh, with the boys rather than standing back watching, you know, this enormous I mean, there were the big wide shots, of course they were, but he, uh, George really likes to focus in uh, on the action. Um, you know, as you know, I played George Pocock who built the boat that the boys rode to victory in. And um, I have the greatest admiration for our props guys and our set construction guys. They built what, seemed to me almost a perfect replica of the boathouse um, where Pocock built the boats in Washington. And it was built on the side of a lake down near Cleveland Water. And the attention to detail was extraordinary. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. You walked in, it was called the Shell House. That was the actual name of the building of Pocock's workshop. Um, where the boats were built, and you walked in and you absolutely were transported back in time to 1936. There were boats slung from the rafters, there were um, training apparatus where the boys did their rowing exercises and things. There was um, uh, the, the little workshop that they built for me uh, with the the, the skeleton of the, the boat on the trestles and all the tools. I mean, the attention to detail was unbelievable. And I was very lucky. The company arranged for me to meet a guy called Bill Coley, who um, is probably one of the very few, if not the only surviving builder of wooden boats. Yeah. Um, in this country. And he came and met me on the set and we went into my workshop. And it was extraordinary to watch him because he moved around the set, touching objects, picking up tools that the props guys had sourced and were using for set decoration. And he was, he was talking to himself saying, this is incredible. This is absolutely, I, and he picked up a particular tool, and he said, I haven't seen one of these for years. So even he was transported, you know, by the sheer sort of beautiful um, replica uh, of um, Pocock's workshop. It, it, it was marvelous. The, those guys who build the sets and do all that stuff, they're incredible. I think probably it's one of the reasons why George Clooney and Grant wanted to film um, in this country because we do have the most amazing talented guys when it comes to you know creating
creating the sets. I suppose you mentioned a key thing there, Peter, when we were talking about it. You mentioned the training apparatus for the the main sort of the boys, uh, Joel Erickton, Callum Turner, Sam Strike, Jack Mulhern, who played the, the rowing team in terms of the training apparatus to sort of teach them in terms of the techniques of sort of rowing. Was that important to the actors themselves and to George as well, that they knew all the techniques and the craft that is to, to go in with rowing? We all know the success and the how hard it is as a professional sport of rowing that these actors wanted to embrace that challenge rather than just having stuntmen shooting all and body doubles shooting all the scenes and maybe having the actors just pop in, say their lines, and then going out and having a a not let's say a a shot, a faraway shot where a stuntman is doing the thing and then back into the actor again. Was it very much important to George and the main leading cast actress that they could be? revel and get the sort of technique and the sort of in terms of rowing and to take on the sort of a challenge of what what is a sport absolutely absolutely i i can't tell you um my admiration for those lads um knows no bounds they started training uh bef long before um we started filming i think they started in january or february um, of last year, um, they were um, stuck into boats. Most of them, I, well, I don't think any of them actually had ever, you know, been in a, a boat like that before or a shell like that before. They, they were pretty, pretty green. And they worked tirelessly, every single one of them, day in, day out, for weeks and weeks and weeks. So that by the time we actually started to shoot, they were beginning, just beginning to look like the real thing. And they went on training every day through the filming. You know, we, we shot, um, the schedule was worked out that most of the rowing would be done in the last two weeks of a 12 week shoot. Yeah. So having started to train, to get fit and to actually learn the techniques of rowing and to learn the techniques of rowing together because that's the incredible thing about this film. It's one thing to film one guy rowing. I can do yeah. that. I learned as a kid to row a, a little dinghy in uh, Whitstable Harbour where I was uh, born and grew up. Uh, but to get eight men working together in absolute you know, unison was a monumental ask. And I do know the boys told me that, you know, the first time George and Grant turned up to see how training had been going, this was long before uh, we'd actually started to shoot. Uh, um, George was a bit sort of um, tight lipped, I think, because uh, they suggested he was probably thinking, God, what have I done? This ain't gonna work. But they worked so hard and I believe that there was one occasion where they actually got to the point where they were able to match the stroke rate, you know, the number of times yeah. you pull on the oar per minute that the Olympic team of 1936 set up. Oh. They weren't able to keep it up for long, but the very fact that these eight guys did it at all was incredible. You know, absolutely incredible. I, I take my hat. They, they were, they, the boys were marvelous and, and they really, they really looked the part. By the time we got to shoot the actual races, they really, really looked the part. They were marvelous. I suppose, Peter, this is really a, a sports sto story in terms of it, its documentary of a fa fascinating event. But in terms of this movie, in terms of these guys, do we get to see their personal stories, their personal backgrounds, their love interests, their flares, their relationships, maybe sort of different emotions, anger, resentment, jealousy? Are there all sort of different themes and emotions running through this movie as well, yeah. apart from yeah. the this sense of achievement? There are, there are. I mean, the film focuses on, on one particular rower, Joe Rance, the, the Callum Turner part, um, because uh, you couldn't really, in the space of a, you know, a two hour film, tell 
every individual's story in great detail. So um, as I believe the book, I've never read the book, but I believe the book focused on young Joe Rance, Rance. Um, uh, so does the film. And you get to see um, Callum uh, going through all sorts of ups and downs with his, with his girlfriend, with his uh, father who abandoned him when he was a small boy, um, through him living uh, through the depression years. I mean, he really only ever signed up to um, the Washington uh, University because he heard that if he, you know, managed to uh, make it into the rowing team, he'd, he'd get a bed to sleep in and uh, um, three square meals a day. So he was doing it, um, and I'm sure the others were as well. Um, he, he was doing it to escape the depression and poverty that was ravishing, you know, the States um, in the 1930s. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the character that I played, George Pocock, was like a kind of substitute father figure for Joe. And when he goes off the rails a little bit and falls out with everybody, um, they have a very, uh, a, a lovely scene together where um, uh, Pocock, who uh, I think is, is a bit of a poet and a bit of a philosopher and a lovely, gentle, wise man. That was, I have to tell you, the reason that I love doing the part so much. I'm usually seen, you know, with a gun in my hand, uh, being chased or chasing somebody else. So to play somebody like Pocock, uh, this wise, gently spoken, um, warm character, encouraging this young man to, um, you know, not, not give up on his dreams uh, was wonderful. So yes, you, you get to see a lot and there's a lovely love story as well between Joe and um, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his girlfriend. Um, absolutely terrific. And I suppose, uh, Peter, before we come on air now, just to stray away a bit from uh, the boys and the boat, uh, we spoke about You've worked with many talented Irish actors and actresses through the years, but you told me, you shared me a story there about a funny moment or a funny time where you had a bit of a laugh on, on set in terms of uh, in-between sort of takes. Uh, you might uh, relive that story now for our Irish viewers and who was the Irish <laughs> actor involved? Well, uh, something springs to mind. Um my, my my wife and I have known the actor Kieran Hines for many, many, many years. Robbie and Kieran worked together at the legendary Glasgow Citizens Theatre um, uh, many years ago. So uh, I've known Kieran a long time, but we'd never, uh, we only ever in over the years worked together once. Um, or, or for the first time, it was a, a series called Ivanhoe. He, he was the baddie. I remember I played Christopher Lee's sidekick. It was a bit like Little and Large, Christopher Lee being very tall and me being, being not nearly so tall. And Kieran and I worked together on that, but then we found ourselves working on Zack Schneider's Justice League together. Um, and uh, we found ourselves in LA dressed up in these very strange suits with sort of black um, yellow dots all over us and um, uh, cameras everywhere and uh, in a completely sort of empty studio uh, where they filmed us sort of growling and snarling at one another. Uh, but of course it looked you know, if, if for a second, you know, you've just stepped out of character for a minute and it was just hilarious, the sight of our, you know, our funny legs in these funny suits uh, and, and trying to be terribly ferocious with one another, knowing, of course, that, you know, in the course of all the magic that goes on with special effects, we were going to be uh, turned into these incredible... Um, and characters of Kieran, I think he was called Steppenwolf, and I was Dark Side or something. Um, and we <laughs> and we we traipsed around the studios for hours on end, 
in these very silly tight suits with our trying to hold our tummies in, you know, and, and look butch. Um, uh, very funny. And it was a sort of fitting way for Kieran and I, after all these years, to finally come together on, on screen. <laughs> and I suppose uh, Peter Guinness now to finally to wrap up for the final 30 seconds. You might enlighten all our audience, all our listeners here in Ireland. Obviously, it's the same day to release in the UK. So when people are going out in the UK to watch the boys in the boat in their cinemas, they'll be going out in Ireland as well due to the, the links and the close ties between the entertainment industry. What will you say to all the Irish audience and all the Irish and the sort of listeners and movie goers that might be intrigued by the fact that George Clooney is directing this movie. Uh, why should they go and watch The Boys and the Boat in terms of the actors and the acting ability? And uh, what's the story for them, Peter? Well, we live in a, oh dear, you know, the world today is a grim place. And um, when all the terrible images that you see on your television screens and things, sometimes I find myself you know, thinking, God, when will this ever, ever get better? Boys in the Boat is a film to cheer you up. It's a real good, solid, feel-good movie. It's the story of a bunch of lads, the underdogs, triumphing against adversity and coming good in the end. And it's a heartwarming uh, story of courage and determination and I guarantee that um, at the end of the film, there'll be quite a lot of, uh, of snivelling and hankies out in the audience. So if you want a good, feel-good movie for the new year to take you away from um, the grimness, although it's got um, some good reminders for us about the past as well. 